Good evening and welcome to the virtual Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Will Frankel and I'm one of your three Athenaeum fellows this year. With billions of people around the globe in some kind of lockdown, humanity may be conducting its largest psychological experiment ever. While most of the public conversation on this experiment has focused on difficult to forecast society-wide impacts on the future, lifelong risks on the individual level are becoming clearer. An open letter of more than 100 specialists in psychology, mental health, and neuroscience predicted that the current lockdown generation of children will have permanent changes in mental resilience and educational preparedness. Indeed, increases in a broad range of mental and behavioral disorders have almost always accompanied large-scale disasters in the past. Facing these challenges, tonight's speaker argues that finding ways to boost connection and practice kindness enable us to intentionally increase our own happiness. Achieving happiness during challenging circumstances and during whatever comes next, then, is not out of our control. Sonia Lubomirsky is a distinguished professor of psychology at the University of California, Riverside, and her department's vice chair. She is the author of two books, The How of Happiness and The Myths of Happiness. Her research covers not only achieving happiness, but also the study of why it matters, addressing three critical questions. What makes people happy? Is happiness a good thing? And how and why do people learn to lead happier and more flourishing lives? Professor Lubomirsky's honors include the Christopher Peterson Gold Medal, a Positive Psychology Prize, and the Faculty of the Year Award at UC Riverside. Using the written Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, we will be accepting questions throughout the program to be posed towards the end of the event. Preference will go to students, so when you send a question, please state your affiliation with the college. Professor Lubomirsky's Athenaeum presentation is co-sponsored by the Berger Institute at CMC. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. And now, please join me in welcoming Professor Lubomirsky to the Athenaeum. Thank you, Will. Um, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, or wherever you are, you're probably all over the place. I'm so happy to be invited to talk to this group at CMC I, and, and the CCs. Um, I wish we were here in person, uh, but we're not, so we're making do. Um, you'll see, I hope everyone can see my slides. This is the building where I work at UC Riverside, and I really miss um, going to the office. I didn't realize I would miss it so much. Um, so the five CCs are really very special to me. My daughter is actually a senior at Scripps. Uh, my son is also at a small liberal arts college, so um, I, I, I feel like I I, can, I know what your experience is like uh, more than the average person. Um, so um, let's get started. I'm here to talk about my research on happiness, which is so relevant right now. Um, my students are collaborators, uh, like all of you have been thinking a lot about trying to understand how to maintain our happiness and our sense of connection during the pandemic. Um, I've been doing research on happiness for more than 30 years. Um, this is the book uh, where the how of happiness where much of the research is described, but I have lots of papers on my website and also want to show you my, my collaborators on the various projects that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so what's happening around the world, um, you know, as Will mentioned, uh, is unprecedented. Um, I don't have the experience or expertise to understand the implications of the pandemic at sort of various levels, but I do have some thoughts about how to talk about the psychology of it all and about how to how do we cope with stress and adversity? Um, how do we maintain and increase our happiness? Um, everything I'm gonna talk about today applies to academic settings, but also workplaces and as well as the home and the family, uh, so sort of to everything. So um, I don't know if we wanna be reminded of this, but just about six months ago, uh, California had our, our, we had our six month anniversary of shelter in place on Wednesday. Uh, on March 11th, the World Health Organization designated COVID-19 as a pandemic. And less than a month later, 95% of the US population had been instructed to stay home. And in countries around the world, of course, people were encouraged to practice distancing, which as you know, means staying six feet away from everyone or outside your household. Uh, or I like um, the Los Angeles Zoo, uh, um, they have it as uh, one zebra away from everyone. So it's good, it's easy to remember. Um, so you would think that radically depriving people of social contact would substantially reduce their feelings of connection and well-being. And lots of research shows that people feel happier and more connected when they're socially interacting with other people. Um, 
On the other hand, we also know from other research that human beings are very resilient. So we're very creative at finding alternative ways to um, sort of satisfy our need to belong and our need for connection when we're deprived of our usual sources of connection. So for example, many people of course have responded to uh, sort of quarantine or sheltering at home orders by organizing lots of sort of Zoom happy hours and cheering up with our neighbors for uh, frontline workers, having drive-by birthdays, you know, going to the park and sitting six feet away and stuff. So we, people have been sort of um, trying to find substitute ways of connecting, but the truth is we, we really have had to force to, re to reduce our social interactions by so much. Of course, you all can't even be you know, on a college campus right now. Um, well, my students and collaborators actually recently tested this question of how people are doing um, during the pandemic. And so I'm gonna start this talk by showing some very recent data. Uh, we just published this very, very recently. So we were fortunate to collect measures of how connected people felt before the pandemic started, uh, and before sheltering at home started in early February. And then we tracked these same people down and gave them the same measures again after the pandemic started. And we even had samples from two different uh, populations. I'm gonna show you, um, uh, here we go. So we had two different populations. We, we had undergraduates at the University of British Columbia, students there were one of our studies. Another study were um, working adults of all ages, primarily from the United States and the United Kingdom. And so the timeline again was before the pandemic or before sheltering at home, early February, and then early April. We also have recent data from late May that we're uh, still not quite ready to show. So what do we find? Well, again, between early February and early April was a time period characterized by the most momentous changes in social behavior that many of us have seen in our lifetimes. Um, so it's, it would be reasonable to expect that there'd be massive declines in feelings of social connection, right? Because we're not actually collecting, connecting in person. Um, now, as you can see in this slide, there's actually surprisingly little change on average. In the first study, the top line, study one, uh, this university, these are college students, they showed only small drops in social connectedness. So these are basically um, items like, I feel understood by the people I know, I feel close to people. And the second sample, which were again, were working adults. The second sample of adults actually, diverse adults, I should say, they actually reported small but significant declines in loneliness. So they actually kind of felt better. So agreeing less with statements like, I feel isolated from others, which is kind of amazing to me because they literally were more, more likely to be isolated from others after the, during the pandemic. Um, so taken together, that we found that people have shown remarkable resilience in the face of this initial disruption of the pandemic. And I should add that I just analyzed the loneliness results from study two from the same sample at the end of May, and there was no change at all in loneliness from, from, like the, um, from April to May. Um, so um, I mean, I do wanna add a caveat, which is that there's the data represent averages and, and the segment of, of, of people in our studies did experience substantial, substantial declines in social connection. One of the kind of, um, I don't know, one kind of heuristic is that often about 15 to 30% of people don't do so well with major changes, whereas 70 to and up are fairly resilient. So there's gonna be a significant number that are, are, are not feeling connected. So anyway, Again, as Will said, we're in the midst of a grand social experiment and we don't know how it's gonna turn out for quite a while, maybe not for a long time. And people's sense of connection is still shifting and evolving, of course. And you know, the outlook for COVID keeps changing and we, get, we either get used to or we get sick of distancing. But the science of happiness and the science of connection can tell us a lot and that's partly why I'm here today. I wanna share with you some of the insights from the research that I and my students do. And I'll describe how and why we're able to maintain and improve happiness both during normal times and during times of great strain and adversity like the last few months. Um, before I begin, I wanna start by defining happiness. I thought that might be a good way to start. So by the way, um, subjective well-being is basically another term for happiness. I use it interchangeably. So I, along with many researchers, define happiness as consisting of essentially two components. The first component is the experience of frequent positive emotions, like experiencing joy, interest, pride, uh, affection, enthusiasm, peacefulness. Uh, not all the time. Of course, the experience of negative emotions at certain times is, is also functional is at appropriate times. And the second component of happiness is having a sense that you're achieving your life goals, that you're satisfied with your life, that your life is good. 
Um, and you can think about these two components as being happy in your life and being happy with your life or about your life. So I kind of like that definition. So that's how I define happiness. Um, okay, so I should also note that hundreds of studies have shown, I, mean, I don't really have time to go into these, but I just wanted to show you, hundreds of studies have shown that people who report being happy in their lives, both happy with their lives and in their lives, tend to be healthier, tend to live longer. They sort of have a lot of um, goods that come to them. Uh, happier people are, have been shown to be more creative, more productive at work, to be better leaders and negotiators, to have more social support, to have more fulfilling relationships, to be better able to bounce back from adversity. I should note that these studies, that these findings I'm showing you are come from correlational studies and longitudinal studies and also experimental studies, because of course the causal directions often goes both, go both ways. So being married, for example, makes people happy, but also it turns out that happy people are more likely to find a, a, someone who wants to marry them. Um, but anyway, so happiness is not just something that feels good. It's also something that is good. It, it's something that um, brings people success in life. Um, okay, so when I talk to people at parties about what I do, I'm often asked the question, is it even possible to become happier and how can we become happier? So that is, that is actually kind of a quest, the question that drives my research. Well, fortunately, tons of um, controlled experiments, randomized controlled experiments, um, have now shown that people can become happier when they deliberately practice what I call positive activities. So I'm going to show you a list of sort of the different kinds of um, studies, interventions that we have done to test different kind, kinds of positive activities, like expressing gratitude, savoring the good things in our lives, um, doing acts of kindness. And so I'm going to tell you about some of these studies today, actually. Um, so in, our, in, our, in my lab, we do, again, happiness interventions. So they're kind of like clinical trials, but instead of testing a new drug or treatment, we might test a new happiness strategy and we have various control groups. So over the course of a few uh, weeks or months, uh, we have our research participants practice a particular strategy on a regular basis. So these are sort of examples of studies we've done. Like we've asked people to visualize your best possible self or to write gratitude letters every week. Um, and then we follow them across time to see if they get happier across time. And as I mentioned, we have various control groups. Now in this, in this talk, uh, I decided to, to focus on one particular type of strategy or activity that is associated with happiness and makes people happy. And that is, um, has to do with uh, pro-social behavior or kindness and generosity. They're basically, um, and, and also being social. So uh, whether sort of being more social or being more generous makes people happy. So that's what we're gonna focus on today. Um, but I'm really interested not just sort of do these activities make people happy, but how and why they work. Sort of what are the, what is the, the how and the why of happiness? And to give you the big picture, I'm gonna show you a model uh, theory, a sort of theoretical framework that drives my research. And this model essentially, essentially illustrates which factors um, kind of are critical to the pursuit of happiness. So on the lower right are what are called person features. So these are features of the happiness seeker. So if, you want, if you're someone who wants to become happier, uh, your personality matters to whether you're gonna be successful, whether you have social support, your culture matters, your motivation matters. On the bottom left, uh, are features of the activity itself matter? So what, what is its dosage? Is it a social? Is it a reflective? So when you, when you sort of ask the question, um, does performing a particular positive activity like expressing gratitude or doing acts of kindness, does that make people happier? It sort of matters what the how is and what the, the how is the, the, the bottom uh, rectangle and the why is at the top. The why are sort of the, the critical mechanisms. So for example, when you express gratitude, it might make you feel more connected to, let's say you express gratitude to your mom by writing a, an email to her and tell, and I encourage everyone to do this, uh, email to her and, and tell her how, you know, what she means to you. Um, that might make you feel more connected to your mom. It might increase the number of positive events in your life. It might lead you to do you know, nice things with her or with other people. Um, so I'll talk today about the how and the why, and I'm gonna refer to this figure throughout my talk. Okay, so let's get started, like launch in into the happiness interventions. So one of the very first interventions that we ever did back in 1999, so 20 years ago or so, um, we asked college students to do acts of kindness over the course of six weeks, and we had three conditions. Uh, and by the way, I'm kind of excited to tell you about this because I recently learned that this particular study and the graph that describes the results was actually featured on the SATs, I think from like a year ago. Um, 
So students basically were told about the study and then they were asked to interpret it. And, and it was so funny because my PhD advisor once told us that you know you've made it when you're the correct answer on the SAT or the GRE test as opposed to the distractor or the filler. Um, so anyway, this, this was on the SAT, um, uh, which you guys don't have to worry about since you've already taken it. Um, so we asked college students to do, to do five acts of kindness every week over the course of six weeks. But furthermore, students either did all five, of, of ki five acts of kindness all on a single day, like all on Monday, do five acts of kindness that you don't normally do, or they spread them out over the course of the week. And the control group was actually not a great control group. We usually have better control groups, but the control group in this study only completed our measures of happiness sort of before and after the intervention, and they, they didn't really do anything else. Um, these are examples, um, actual examples of what students said they did um, when, they, um, when they did their acts of kindness. You know, cooked, donated blood, helped a stranger with computer problems. Um, and my favorite was told the professor, thank you for his hard work. Um, so they ranged from sort of small, simple behaviors to fairly big ones. Uh, okay, so what do we find? So here is a graph that shows you the results. So these are changes in happiness from immediately before to immediately after the six week intervention. And so you see here that students who committed acts of kindness experienced a significant increase in well being and happiness. But interestingly, this increase was only evident for those who showed their weekly generosity all in one single day. There I see the blue bar. They're the only group that's actually increasing happiness. Why did this happen? And I think we see evidence here that dosage or sort of the timing of the activity is critical. So um, my hunch is that because many of the kind of acts that people did were um, small things, that it made them kind of less distinguishable from other um, behaviors over the course of a week. And so it's kind of like, it's more powerful and, and impactful to swallow all the pills at once. Um, I mean, don't do that with pills, but the idea is like you do all five acts of kindness all in one day, and it's sort of more salient and more powerful. So, so getting back to the, uh, the figure that I showed you at the beginning, um, this, this study basically shows that it's important to consider the timing or the dosage of a positive activity, sort of what, what's the dosage, what's the optimal dosage, when you're trying to craft sort of the optimal kind of hack for happiness or the optimal strategy to become happier. Okay, moving on to another study I wanna show you about. I wanna, there's another example of something to consider when you're trying to maximize the success of a happiness strategy. And that is whether the strategy is, directed, is directing attention towards yourself or towards other people. So in this study, we had a diverse group of participants uh, engaged in a four week uh, kindness intervention. And so, we had three groups, uh, or actually we had, well, three groups I want to show you. Um, we uh, asked people to either do kind acts for others, just like in the previous study, or we asked, this is the red line, or we asked people, the blue line, to do kind acts for yourself, okay? And by, by that, I mean kind of like nice, like self-indulgent things, you know, maybe have a nice lunch or take a nap or get a massage or you know, see a friend, like something that's, uh, you know, sort of positive, but you do it for yourself, not for others. And then we had a control group that was asked to organize their time by keeping track of their daily activities. So we sort of build it as like, uh, this is going to help you organize your time. Um, and so we found in this, in this study, this graph shows changes in participants, which we, we measured flourishing in over to, which is very, which is basically well-being. Um, after, doing acts of kind, act, after doing acts of kindness for others or for themselves or a neutral organization activity. And what we found, as you can see here, only the group that did acts of kindness for others became happier from baseline to post test, so that's the four weeks. And then they stayed happier through the follow-up. And I guess I forgot to mention there was a two week follow-up in this study. So um, doing kind acts for yourself did not actually sort of impact flourishing in any kind of enduring way. So this graph shows so I guess this study demonstrates that ironically, if you wanna make yourself happier, you need to sort of try to make other people happier. So you wanna direct your attention on other people. Um, as kind of a, an aside, I think a lot of life's problems are due to people focusing basically too much on themselves. I mean, we all do that, um, but we focus when you're sort of too self-absorbed, you focus too much on yourself, you, um, you, some, you often feel even worse. Okay. Um, another example of an experiment that I want to tell you about. Okay, so that's sorry, that's that. Going back to the model, this uh, study showed the importance of looking at other versus self-oriented uh, positive activities. That's something that's other-oriented. Anything that takes attention off of yourself and onto others might might make you happier. So, for example, actually during the pandemic, 
we find a lot of people have been very pro-social and very generous, like helping elderly neighbors or helping, you know, your, your sibling with Zoom school. And that is, that is increasing well-being and that is making people feel more connected. Um, okay, so now I wanna talk about another experiment. Uh, let me explain this slide. We did a study recently with more than 500 working adults. And in this study, we asked people to engage in more kind acts, to do more kind acts like the last study, or we asked people to engage in more social interactions. So just like on Monday, um, engage in three more social interactions than you normally do. Now this was easier to do before the pandemic where now it's a little bit harder. Um, Cause we wanted to see like, does it matter what, that the interaction is pro-social or whether it's just social, right? Maybe it's the social element that matters. And actually in this study, it didn't, it didn't matter. So uh, being social was just as happiness and connecting as being pro-social. Um, but we were really interested in sort of some of the um, sort of factors that are involved in like what increases connection. So in this study, we found that the two important factors impacted whether our participants were able to connect and benefit from those kind of social acts. Um, so basically, we asked people while you were like chatting with your barista, you know, that social act, or while you were helping your neighbor, how connected did you feel with them? How like warm did you feel? Did you feel in sync with them? Did you feel kind of like a sense of mutual trust? Were you invested in their well-being? Um, and so we found that the first thing, the medium mattered. So we looked at um, how people engage in these social and pro-social interactions. You can see in this slide, basically people who did the kind or social act in person or via video chat or by phone, they felt the most connected. And those three didn't actually differ from each other. That was a little surprising to, to us because I thought that in person would be more connecting. Um, and then followed by phone, followed by text message, followed by email, social media was sort of the lowest uh, in terms of how connected uh, people felt. So that was um, interesting and I guess sort of not so surprising. So here we have a uh, finding that the medium mattered. So as you can see on the right, we have a little uh, summary there, the medium mattered, the more visual and audio contact, the more connected people felt and the happier they were. Now, we also found that the target mattered. So who did you do the generous thing for or who did you interact socially with mattered? And it turned out um, that if it was a romantic, if you have a romantic partner or a spouse, um, uh, if that kind or social act was directed towards your romantic partner, you felt the most connected, followed by family, followed by friends, followed by coworkers, et cetera. So sort of, you could see that closeness of whoever you're interacting with really matters in terms of how connecting you feel. So again, this is uh, showing the target mattered. Uh, and you see on the right, as I write, the closer the target of kinder social acts, the more connected people felt and the happier they were. So, um, um, so I think that's, again, not surprising. And I, and I wanna show you some other, like actually really hot, hot off the process data that I think pretty relevant. And these data, I'm gonna tell you, is this is the first audience that I'm showing these data outside of my lab. So um, this, is, this is more coming more from that COVID and connection study that I talked about earlier. So we wanted to know, uh, and that's, remember what we measured, how lonely and how connected people felt before the pandemic versus after. So we wanted to know, well, did it matter like if you live alone or not? Like what features of household, of the household or household size matter? Like, does it matter if you live alone? Does it matter how many people you live with? Does it matter, you know, what matters? And so what we found in terms of like, whether you feel more or less connected during the pandemic versus before the pandemic. And so what we found was that, um, uh, that living alone did not matter how, in terms of how connected you felt how many people you live with didn't matter, whether you live with kids didn't matter, whether your caregiver didn't matter, whether you lived with a pet didn't matter. We thought all those, th all those things would matter. The only, the only thing that mattered was whether you lived with a partner. So you see on this slide that those who were living with a partner, a romantic partner, again, a spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend, um, from they actually, we actually saw increases, they actually felt more connected from before the pandemic to during the pandemic, if, if those who lived without a partner felt less connected. So, so that's really interesting. So um, social interactions with significant others really mattered for connection and happiness. Um, you, some of you might know um, that there's been like really mixed effects of the pandemic. There's been sort of more divorces, but also more marriages. And there are something called turbo relationships. Like I know quite a few people who've like suddenly they're like really, really intense in a relationship. Um, so um, anyway, uh, cool, cool finding that we're actually, it's under review right now, so that's not published yet. Okay, okay, now I wanna tell you about a few more studies relevant to kind and social interactions. 
but we have recently become interested in whether positive activities like kindness and gratitude do a lot more than make people happy. So for example, it turns out that doing acts of kindness not only does it make us feel happy and connected, but it can have other benefits in other domains of our life. So I'm gonna show you a study, one study that's about health. So uh, do kind acts do more than increase happiness? We find that kind, kindness changes our immune gene expression. So in a really, really cool study, we had four groups of people. So again, another randomized controlled experiment. We had four conditions. And this is gonna, is very similar to, to a study that I showed earlier, so you'll recognize it. The control condition, we asked people over the course of four weeks to keep track of their daily activities. We told them it will help them feel, get more organized. Uh, we had a world condition. So we asked people to do acts of kindness for the world. So that's kind of like pick up litter or you know whatever, help the planet not like for individual people. Then the other condition, do acts of kindness for other people. And then a self-condition like before, do acts of kindness for yourself. Now in this study, we, we collected blood from subjects before and after the, um, this four week intervention. And we ha I have a collaborator at UCLA who's an immunologist. And so he analyzed the blood, the blood spots to, for, for RNA gene expression. And this is what we found. Basically what we found was only in the do kind acts for other people condition, we found that uh, people showed through their blood changes in RNA gene expression that were associated with a healthier immune response as shown in the slide. And you can see the decrease here only in the kind acts for other condition, the decrease represents down regulation of pro-inflammatory genes, okay? So think more inflammation is bad. So down regulation of pro-inflammatory genes uh, is good. So we only saw that in the kinds of acts for others conditions. So that's pretty cool. Um, uh, just, but it's just one study. So we're trying to replicate it uh, right now in two other studies. In fact, we just learned that we partially replicated these results in a new study where we've actually found that doing acts of kindness for others and for yourself um, led to increases in antiviral RNA activity, which is really cool in the middle of the pandemic to show that. But again, we're still, we're, we have to replicate that now because uh, we want to be confident. We don't want to go. I mean, I, actually, I would say go out and do Kinex for others and maybe that will, maybe they'll boost your immune system, but I, I can't be sure until we replicate it. Okay. I want to tell you very quickly about another study where we found that um, another powerful benefit of being kind to others is that it actually leads people to um, become more popular with their peers, to be more accepted by their peers. So this is a study that we did. Um, this is one of the few studies we've done with kids, most of our studies with adults. So we went to the beautiful city of Vancouver, as you can see there, I don't know if anyone recognized that in the, on the picture. Um, and we went into the Vancouver school district and we went into 11 different schools and 19 different classrooms. Um, and we did a four week intervention with the kids and these are fourth, fifth and sixth grade kids. So there were like ages nine to 11. Uh, and we asked these kids to do three acts of kindness or to visit three locations. Okay, so let me show you what we found. So the kindness condition, we asked these kids every week to do three acts of kindness. The whereabouts condition, we asked them every week to go to three different places and report where they went. And so we found, what we found was that the kids who did acts of kindness after the intervention were more likely to be nominated by their peers as, as kids that they want to play with. So on the left, you see, this is a very standard measure of self, uh, self ex, uh, peer acceptance, uh, where you basically give, an, give every kid a list of all the kids in their class and they circle the ones they want to play with. Um, and so it's kind of cool. It's as though like you made an extra friend, like friend and a half. Well, actually friend. So it goes from basically 0.5 to 1.5. So uh, it's an increased number of nominations um, uh, for the kids who did acts of kindness. And why did that happen? It's actually really interesting because the kind acts that these kids did weren't in the classroom. They were almost always at home. So they were like helping their mom. They were helping their brother. And so there's something that rubbed off on them when they went back into the classroom. Maybe they were sort of more positive, more confident, more happy. <clears throat> we made other kids like them more. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, okay, so as you can see in this talk, we've done quite a few studies revealing the benefits of doing acts of kindness for happiness, and, but also for other things, for connection, for peer acceptance, and for even for gene expression. And indeed, pro-social behavior appears to be one of the most powerful if not the, the, if not the most powerful way to boost well-being. So what is so special about kind acts? What is so special about sort of generosity? Well, we think that doing acts of kindness can benefit people for like multiple reasons that are kind of interrelated. So helping others makes us feel more connected. 
with others. It make it strengthens our relationships. It makes us feel more optimistic of, about humanity as a whole. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where you sort of volunteer, you help others, and you just you just feel like better about like humanity, or you when you watch other people help. <coughs> Excuse me. It makes us feel like we're all kind of interdependent, like we're all in the same boat, we're all in it together. And of course, it also makes us feel like a good person, like I'm a good person for helping others. So, so we wanted to test this, these, these intuitions. And so we did a study uh, where we um, asked our participants to do one of four things. So again, we have four conditions of study, and this one is a, this was a two-week intervention. And in this case, our our participants were um, all people, adults from Australia. So we had 490 Australians do this. And so in one condition, we asked people to do X kind X for others. Again, this was randomly assigned. People were randomly assigned to one of these four conditions. But then we wanted to create some really like powerful, positive comparison conditions. So we also asked people to do kind X for themselves. So that's so those two you're kind in both situation, but one condition you're kind to someone else and the other condition you're kind to yourself. And then we had a condition where we asked people to act more extroverted. So we've done some research in my lab, where we have this one study that's really, really, uh, probably the most, we have, we have the strongest effects we've ever found, where we simply ask for one week, go out and act more extroverted, okay? And then for the second week, go and act more introverted or vice versa. We actually didn't use those words because they're kind of loaded. Um, so we asked people like to act more sociable, assertive, and energetic for, for an extroversion. And we found the biggest effect sizes we've ever gotten in any of our studies were people who acted extroverted, even the introverts who acted extroverted became hugely happier, more positive emotion, more flow, more meaning, all of that. And so we know that just acting more social makes people happy, at least temporarily. That was only a week long study, maybe for longer, the introverts would get exhausted. But anyway, so we have an extroverted condition. And we also ask people to engage in more open minded acts. So that was our fourth group. And so that's also a positive activity. It has to do with being open to intellectual pursuits, to art and music, etc. cetera. Uh, so note, note, note that all of these comparison conditions are all positive and beneficial. So it's kind of a very strong test of our hypothesis. Uh, okay, so what we found, first we looked at, we asked people how connected did you feel while you were engaging in these activities? And we found that both the people who did kind acts for others and who did social acts felt more connected. So that makes sense. We also asked people how competent did you feel while you were doing these, these activities? And only the kind acts for others condition felt significantly more com competent relative to the other three groups. And this is my favorite. We also asked people um, how, if they had a sense of meaning while they were doing these activities and the Kinex for Others group reported greater meaning while they were engaged in Kinex for Others relative to the other groups. So basically what we found is that kind acts to others sort of are more beneficial, highly impactful, highly impactful and indeed special. Okay, so I'm gonna conclude my talk um, I know I know I talk a little I talk fast, but I uh, um, but we'll have more time for questions. Um, I'm going to conclude my talk basically on what might sound like a worn out cliche, but as you have now seen, I have sort of landed on this on this cliche after a great deal of research, and that is if you want to be happier and you want to experience the benefits of happiness, such as greater work productivity and better relationships and superior health, I advise you to focus not on yourself but on other people. Uh, and during the pandemic, when our social interactions are limited and our stress levels are high and the risk of infection is scary for a lot of people, helping and supporting others will not only benefit the targets of your kindness, but will also benefit your own stress level, your own well-being, and perhaps even protect you from illness. Um, okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I'd love to answer your questions. That's my favorite part. Thank you so much, Professor. So our first question is regarding the first graph that you showed on your presentation. So the question is, how do you think patterns of connection and loneliness change over the course of the pandemic? So initially, we may have reached out more to others and um, connected more to others. But as the pandemic has continued, fatigue may have set in. Um, and how does this influence um, our feelings of social connectedness? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, that is a really great question because we first did we were we first did the study right like this was uh, uh, early what was it early April yeah early April April eighth ninth um, and so that was um, and actually we thought that we'd have the strong the biggest 
uh, drops in connection right away, right? Because it was such a shock. Remember those early weeks, there was such a shock. Um, and then people would sort of adapt. But then the, the alternative hypothesis is kind of, I think this question implies is that people like maybe get really weary and, you know, feel more and more and more isolated. And so, as I mentioned, we also have data from, from end of May where we found no change. So that's already March, April, May, two and a half months into it. But we don't have data that are like really recent, you know, through the summer. Um, I should mention that there's lots of studies that have coming out looking at mental health and well-being around the world. And those studies are showing that basically about 15% of people around the world are having severe mental health, mental health challenges, more like clinical depression, clinical anxiety, um, which is obviously related to connection and well-being. Uh, whereas many, many people are doing just fine. Some people are doing even better. I don't know if you guys have heard that uh, now researchers are talking about uh, a K-shaped recovery. So it used to be V-shaped or W-shaped. Now it's a K-shaped where some people are going to do actually better economically, but also psychologically, and other people are, are going to do worse. Um, so we don't really know the answer, but uh, it just seems like for a subset of people, connection is like they're feeling a lot less connected, but for the average person, they're, they're still doing fine, which is kind of surprising to me, but they're still, they're doing fine. Our next question is also about comparing the average person to people within specific groups. Mm -hmm. And it's, were the results of your studies at all stratified by race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status? And if so, what differences did you see between groups in the influences of happiness? Um, thank you. I'm just going to, I'm just putting this up as just an example of a study. Um, we, that's a great question, and we always look at gender differences and ethnic differences. We don't always have big enough samples, but sometimes we do. And we have never found, pretty much never found uh, any kind of differences by group, by class, by ethnicity, by gender, by age. Um, we have one study, oh, the extroversion study I talked about, you know, when people acted more extroverted versus acted more introverted, we found that uh, Latinx people, um, benefited more. So like they got even happier from acting extroverted. Um, although they were sort of more extroverted to begin with. Um, but it's very, very rare. Pretty much never do we find any differences. So partly it could be because we often don't have the, the, the power to, you know, we need a big sample size to determine, to establish that. Um, I mean, one explanation, it could be that, you know, happiness, like well-being is like a pretty universal thing. Doing acts of kindness, ex you know, engaging in um, expressing gratitude, I mean, these are sort of universal things that are good for humans, you know, connection. It's not like uh, genders or ethnicity, uh, you know, benefit more. But we have found cultural differences, I should mention. So we sometimes, not sometimes, we've done quite a few studies. I didn't really have time or I didn't, didn't think of to include them in this talk, but we compare different countries and there we do find differences. So just as a couple of quick examples, we did, a, we did a study in Korea versus in the United States where we asked people to write gratitude letters. And we found that the, in, in undergrads, Korean students did not benefit from writing gratitude letters, but American students got happier after writing gratitude letters. And it sounds like in Korea, the expression of gratitude is really kind of a mixed um, emotional situation that often people feel indebted after expressing gratitude. Um, thanking your parents is con sometimes even considered like almost like insulting for, because you're thanking them for doing something that they consider their duty. Um, so that's interesting. So again, that was like a gratitude a difference across cultures. We also recently did a study in uh, Hong Kong and the United States where we asked people to recall acts of kindness towards either close, like friends and family versus strangers. And Americans felt happier when they recalled acts of kindness towards family or strangers. But the people in Hong Kong felt, felt happier when they recalled acts of kindness towards close, close others as opposed to distant others. So there's a cultural difference. There. So we have found some cultural differences. Thank you. The next question is also related to your study. Someone wants to know um, if you factored in pre-existing mental health conditions when compiling all this information. So that's a great question too. Um, so we sometimes look at base, what we call baseline like happiness or baseline mental health. And what we find almost always is that people who start off kind of worse off, so they're less happy, or they're more anxious, more vulnerable, I guess I would just call it kind of a vulnerability factor, they tend to benefit more from these interventions. But it could just be a floor effect, right? A floor effect just means that they start, they're start they starting lower, and so they kind of have more room to grow in happiness, and more room to improve. 
Um, uh, there are other research that shows that sometimes these kinds of interventions can backfire for people who have mental health conditions. And so, it, although it really depends. So here's one example for gratitude. Um, so um, we, this study has not been done and it may be unethical to do it, but I do think it's really important to do it. And I've been talking to researchers, to, to clinicians about it, but, but it turns out that gratitude could actually be harmful for people who are clinically depressed and especially people who are severely depressed and suicidal. So people who are suicidal often believe that they're a burden on their friends and family. And so and that's partly why they want to end their life because they feel like there's so much, there's so much of a burden. And imagine if you ask someone like that to express gratitude about how great, you know, how supportive their friends and family have been, it might make them feel even more of a burden. Um, so things like that, or it might make them feel guilty to express gratitude, guilty they haven't repaid it. Um, and so I think it's really important to look at Un, you know, underlying or like baseline mental health conditions. Um, and we haven't done that so much, but there's some clinicians working on that. Our next question touches on moral psychology. Uh, it seems like your research supports the argument that doing good might truly be about uh, feeling good about oneself. Do any of your findings shed light on the debate regarding whether it's possible for humans to act in ways that are truly altruistic and not just about their own well-being? Yeah, yeah. Great question, kind of a classic question about whether altruism really exists, because um, there's a debate about this. So, because basically the idea that true altruism is you're doing it, not like because it makes you feel good, right? But because of, um, yeah, to, just to benefit the other person. Um, and I can't pretend that I can like resolve that debate. Um, so that's why in the, the note, note that I never use the word altruism, I just use the word pro-social behavior, which is basically benef behavior that benefits someone else. And I would argue, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. Like it's good to be helpful, even if it, even if it makes you feel good, or if it enhances your reputation, or if you get something out of it, because uh, the person might repay you later. It's still really good to be generous. So I can't really resolve that debate, and I think no one's quite resolved it. I mean, there are some, um, there you know, there's some examples like you know uh, the person who sort of jumps into a river to save someone from drowning. And they literally, they just do it automatically. They don't think about it. The idea is they're not thinking like, oh, this is gonna benefit me. But even in that kind of extreme example, you could argue that, that, that it was so um, aversive, it was so distressing to watch someone who might potentially drown that you sort of do it almost to relieve your own distress so much. So there's always an alternative explanation that benefits the self when it comes to kindness or pro-social behavior. So, I guess I, I guess that would mean that I'm more on the side that I can't really think of a situation that all pure altruism exists, but great question. So um, connections are on one side and the information we consume is on another side. So how do you think this negative news cycle that we are all consuming affects our happiness during mm -hmm. this time? Mm -hmm. Well, there's been some studies on that already where that are showing that the more people spend on reading news, well, especially kind of negative news, like COVID related news, the more anxious they are. Now that's a correlation. And so it could just be like anxiety prone people are sort of spending more time um, on those kinds of um, news sources. So again, I've seen some, and I'm not an expert in this, in this area, but I have seen some, some data showing that, yeah, there is a relationship between looking at negative news um, and well-being. Um, I'm not sure about sense of connection. I don't think they've measured that. Um, so just the research suggests that you want to at least limit the amount of time you spend looking at the news, or especially negative news. Next question returns to the issue of how these data break down in terms of specific identities and subgroups. Based on your available data, are there differences in outcomes with those extending acts of kindness to others that are more or less like themselves, mm -hmm. according to their identity, their interests, their proximity, or any other descriptors? No, that's a, that's a wonderful question. And I don't have any data, unfortunately, um, to, to speak to. Uh, let me think about, um, um, yeah, I mean, the only, the only thing that, that's relevant that we have is the, the Hong Kong data where our participants in Hong Kong were not as happy when they helped people who are more distant to, from them. So again, maybe we interpreted that as more of like out group versus in group. So you're sort of happy when you help the in group and not so much as help the out group. So we do have data on that. Um, I don't really know of any studies that look at kind of different from you versus similar to you. Um, but um, yeah, but that's, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, 
where there's some work on just social interaction. Like if you engage in like a deep, meaningful, intimate conversation with people who are different from you, that you actually feel much more, much more closer to them, feel more positive about their group. So I think there is something, some potential there in terms of, in terms of reducing like intergroup conflict, reducing prejudice and racism by having members of different um, groups like really interact in a very deep way, right? Not just like get together for a chat, but like really ask each other intimate questions about their lives. Because again, the idea is that it sort of highlights how we're all human, how we're really all, you know, we're, we have more in common than we think we do. So research suggests that parents of young children are reporting the highest levels of stress and anxiety. Do you have any suggestions for parents to increase their well-being, but also increasing the well-being of their children? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I'm not sure what the what what the young like what the ages are that that the questioner is talking about. Um, but certainly, people who have kids and they don't have, and they're like in Zoom school or they don't have childcare right now during COVID, it's it's extremely stressful. And I have I have two little I mentioned my two college age kids, but I also have two little kids who are in uh, second and fourth grade, and it's it's very difficult. Um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of I don't know, I, I in terms of recommendations, it's funny. I often I'm often asked about how to make kids happier. A lot of people are really interested in that, and there's really not much research or like books about that. Um, like they want me to write the how of happiness for kids. Um, I might go back to my first slide. Um, so, but I, I don't, and, but I'm not a developmental psychologist. So I, I, I feel like I don't really know um, much about that. Um, I feel like, I mean, there are some studies with adolescents and with younger kids, and they basically show the same kinds of strategies work, but they just need to be adapted for kids, right? So, but like, kids love helping, you know, from a very, very young age. Um, uh, they are, they feel rewarded by helping others. Like there's these cute videos of studies, like uh, little toddlers will like help their experimenter um, without being, without prompting. Um, so I would, I would, I would guess that they're, they're the same kinds of strategies that, that are effective for increasing happiness. Adults are effective in kids, just you have to kind of tailor them. Um, I mean, I certainly have tried that with my own kids and try to kind of focus on positives and express gratitude around the dinner table. But there's sort of a certain age where they get to where they they don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> so um, you have to, I don't know, do do what works with your own children. I should mention one, one kind of thought, like a general theme that runs through my research is, is the idea of fit, which is that you have to kind of use the strategy that fits your personality or your values or your culture or your uh, weaknesses or your strengths. Um, and same thing with your kids, you know, like one thing may not work for them, but something else might. This question comes from a student wondering whether you would say that introversion as it's commonly known, at least, uh, even actually exists considering that all people in your study benefited from extroverted actions. Oh, no, I think it does absolutely exist. Um, and I am partially, I, I started out, I was trained as an experimental social psychologist, but I, I have a lot of colleagues at UC Riverside that are personality psychologists. So I am very, very convinced that extroversion, introversion are very real and just are replicated in all cultures pretty much. Um, yeah, I think it does exist. I mean, it's interesting. Uh, Susan, some of you are familiar with Susan Cain's book called Quiet, which is about introversion, which I really highly recommend for anyone who's, who is an introvert or who's interested in introversion. Um, it's really, uh, it's really a great book. It has a great description of what introversion is like. And, and the best, what, what a lot of people talk about from that book is that Susan Cain describes, basically you're an, you're an extrovert. If you go to a party and afterwards, and you come back you come home and you're energized. And if you're an introvert, you go to a party and but after, you might still enjoy the party. You might even enjoy the party equally, but afterwards you're exhausted. Um, and that clearly is a major individual difference. Um, I, I'm not sure about what happened with I'm not sure why the introverts benefited so much from from the social be, from the extroverted behavior. I think it's part because it was only a week. So so again, if it was like a month, maybe they'd get exhausted. But in, another thing that's actually something important to keep in mind, when we ask people to act, to act more extroverted, we, we, we sort of left it up to them how to do that. So it doesn't mean like 100% of the day they have to act extroverted. It could be that when I'm having lunch with my friends, I'm just gonna like speak up a little bit more than I usually do, right? Or so I'm, oh, I'm gonna try to be more energetic during blah, 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 during my class. So, um, so it's, it's, it's just like they increase like moments of extroversion maybe throughout the week, which, which might not have been too burdensome. 
And staff member wants to know, um, how is happiness affected by compassion fatigue? Mm, right, compassion fatigue. Oh, well, actually, this, this, this bears on a really important theme. I guess, again, something else that I didn't include in my talk is I often like to sort of talk about how the pursuit of happiness might backfire. And so one way my backfire with kindness, right, is that you're, you basically are too kind. Remember I talked about dosage and it's important to consider the dosage of positive activity. So if the dosage of kindness is too much, then that's going to backfire and it might lead to compassion fatigue, for example, or it just might, it, it, worse, it might just lead you to feel exploited. Like you're just sort of helping other people too much, taking advantage of, or just not, it, it loses its meaning, or you neglect your own self-care because you're spending, you know, we all know people who are like too caring and helping others too much to, ne to the neglect of themselves. Um, so yeah, I would say that compassion fatigue would, would impair happiness. This one dovetails nicely with the previous one. Do you think there's such a thing as too much happiness? Yeah, yes, there is. Um, and actually, it's a really nice paper on this by Ed Diener and his colleagues. Ed Diener, D-I-E-N-E-R, sort of the person who kind of founded the whole field of happiness. And, um, and, yeah, and he's great. And he's still around. Um, he spent most of his career at the University of Illinois. And so he has this paper where he looked at how happy people are and uh, their social relationships and their productivity at, at work and their actually the generosity of volunteering. And so what he found was basically the ideal level of happiness on a one to 10 point scale was a, an eight or like not more than eight. So if you're a nine or 10, that was too high, at least in actually not for relationships. It turns out if you're dating someone who's a 10 in happiness, that's good. We want to be with people who are happy. But if your work, your colleague or your employee is uh, a 10, then that's not so good because they're not, they're maybe not as good a colleague or employee. Um, and so the way I like to think about it is that um, if you're too happy, you might be seen, it might be seen as inappropriate, right? Like you're inappropriately happy in some, in, in a lot of situations, people might be envious. Um, and, um, uh, what was the other thing that I was going to say about too much happiness? Oh, it's kind of like, you know, when you're first in love and you're just so happy and that's all you can think about and you, you just can't really get anything done because you're so happy. Like we don't, we just can't afford to be that happy all the time. So that would be, I guess, my, the easiest answer to that question. So this is on your um, graph that talked about living with a partner and that people who lived with partners felt mm -hmm. more connected. Um, mm -hmm. So someone wants to know, does the quality of the relationship that person shared um, have an effect on their feelings of connectedness and did age play a role? In right. Um, in that study, we, I think we just didn't have enough participants. So like we didn't find that age played a role, um, but I, I'm not necessarily saying that they wouldn't, maybe in a bigger study it would have, it, but in, in the quality relationship clearly matters, right? And that's kind of what we see, like in Wuhan, there's an uptick in divorces and an uptick in marriages, right? So, um, but we didn't, again, we didn't, oh, we didn't ask that question in our study because we hadn't, remember we collected uh, the pre-pandemic data um, in February before we knew there was going to be a pandemic. So we didn't sort of think that we would need to know the answers to some of these questions. Um, but yeah, clearly it matters, right? So, and we, we see there's a lot of, lot written and talked about, especially now people are sort of st like spouses are stuck together. And I don't know, some of you or your parents like kind of stuck working at home or not working at home, you know, all day, every day. And that creates a lot of friction and tension in the household. So some people are doing great and they're bonding and doing like fun things together, quality time and others are actually doing badly. So clearly that matters and just, we just did not measure it. This is gonna be our last question from our attendees tonight. And it's whether there are some acts of kindness that provide the greatest benefits or return on investment that you found from just generally nudging people to do anything. Mm, that's a good question. Um, we, we do code the acts of kindness. We usually, we often have judges sort of code them in terms of like, what are they? And are they big or small? Are they like directed towards family or, or others? Or, you know, like we have various codes. We have yet actually to find kind of any feature of the act of kindness that was like that, that was significantly associated with improvements in happiness. And it could just be that there's such a diverse variety of kind of acts of kindness that people do that we just sort of haven't, Maybe we need to have like, you know, 100,000 people do acts of kindness and then only we'd find something. Um, 
So, so I guess the answer, the question, the answer to that question is, I don't know. Like we haven't yet to find that there, and, and also I think that it's very individual, right? Like you can imagine it's very personalized. Like, so for, for you, for some people, it might be like cooking for your family or your friends, like might really make you happy, right? For others, like they hate cooking and they would rather do something else. So, so clearly these things are very, need to be kind of tailored and customized to individuals. And again, that's kind of my, one of the themes of my work is this idea of fit is really important. That, that most of what I've, in fact, even most of what I showed you today are averages. And so they're not gonna necessarily apply to everyone. I think it's important to know what the average is, kind of like this, like when you know a drug on average works for people, that's really important to know. Uh, but it's also important to know when, you know, something is not gonna be as effective for, for every individual the same way. Thank you so much for speaking with us and for answering all of those questions. Uh, I want to close by opening it up to you to leave any parting remarks. Oh, wow. Uh, well, thank you. Um, it was great to talk to you guys. The questions were fantastic. And it just makes me really miss being on a college campus and seeing all you students. And um, yeah, I guess those are my, my parting remarks. I mean, I hope you're all doing well and finding ways to connect and help each other. And I, I just can't wait until it's all over and uh, we can just see each other in person. I mean, I'm really interested. I guess one thing I could end with is my lab is also really interested. I haven't mentioned this in differences between face-to-face -face versus virtual like digital interactions. And so we have a whole line of research on like smartphone use and happiness and whether that can be impairing or eroding connection. And it clearly is, but it's, it's like a more nuanced story than, than sort of it is bad or good. Like we know technology is both good and bad. Um, and so we, we now have all these like video and other kinds of connections, which are again, which are good and better than nothing. But, but I think face-to-face, -face, clearly human beings were hardwired to interact face-to-face, -to, -face, to have those nonverbal cues in front of us, to have touch, to have smell, to have, to have voice, um, that, that is just harder to read people you know, when, we're, when we're on video. So I just, yeah, I guess maybe like everyone, I just can't wait until we can interact more face-to-face. -face. So thank you. On behalf of Claremont McKenna College and the Athenaeum, thank you all for joining us tonight. A special thanks to the Berger Institute, Professor Lubomirsky, and to all of those who sent in their questions. Don't forget to join us for our next virtual ATH event, which will be on Wednesday, September 23rd at 5 p.m. Pacific. Peter Rice, the chairman of Walt Disney Television, will be joining us for an in-depth conversation about the entertainment business and its challenges today. Thanks, everyone.